Hey everyone! The Fantasy Companion for Savage Worlds is a fantastic resource to run fantasy campaigns in your Savage Worlds tabletop RPG. Eric and I sat down, did a super deep dive on the character side of it, including ancestries, including hindrances, including edges, and we went through everything really in detail. So this is a two-parter video. Um, both are super long, but if you want to get into the guts and hear opinions on what's good, what can be used together, how it compares to other things, this is the video series for you. So let's start off with part one. Hey everyone, it's Carl and Eric with Tabletop Tango. Hello! <laughs> Look at the bubbles, do the stuff, We'd love your support. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have a podcast called Mastering the RPG. You can check that out as well. Um, and uh, any support you give, email, leave some comments, what you think about the Fantasy and Companion, what your favorite uh, ancestry is, what your favorite edge, whatever it is, just throw something in the comments for us. We'd love to see it, love to hear it. Um, all right. Well, thanks much. So, Eric, uh, looks like got you on the microphone tonight. We're going to be talking about yeah. the character part of the Fantasy Companion. But maybe you want to say what the Fantasy Companion is first for for our readers at home. Yeah, I mean, I feel like a lot of people know kind of what the Companions do or, or are for. But if you don't know, they are supplements to the main core Savage Worlds rules, or Suede is the current edition. And they are meant to greatly expand upon a certain genre. So you have the Fantasy Companion, you have the Horror, which is coming out soon. You have Sci-Fi, which is coming out soon. The Superhero, Superpowers one. So these are all meant to just kind of, you know, give you a lot more options to do a certain type of game. Um, the Fantasy Companion, I would say for Swex, which was the Explorer's Edition. I, I mean, would you say it's a little bit infamous? I think people people were kind of more on the the, you know, like if the people liked it or not. I, I, I always remember people yeah. thought it wasn't the best book at it compared to the other companions I, I never used it um, honestly so i never used it yeah so. i never got to use it that much either i i mean i would say i, I think they did a better job on this one i mean that's oh, yeah. we're, we're saying it up front <laughs> so you know to, to spoil the review there but i think it's a better version so um yeah so in here you'll see all the types of options like carl said to doing any you know a lot of different types of fantasy games um a really big thing here is the best, the bestiary and all the items and magic items. Those are really important for fantasy games. And then it brings a lot of like, it brings a lot of upgrades to even the core book. So you'll see a lot of stuff in here that they're slowly petering into the normal book. Um, so just know that like the more current rules are in this book. And there's also some stuff that I just think are essential almost, like some basic combat edges that I think should be in the core book. Um, and there's a lot of changes to like powers and some added powers that I think are really good. So yeah, that's the summary of the book. All right, well, great. And tonight, um, or today, whenever you're watching this, uh, we're only <laughs> gonna talk about character, the character part of the book all the way through yeah. edges. Uh, we're not gonna go into anything else because this is probably gonna be long enough as it is. But without <laughs> further ado, we should jump right into it and start off and um, talk a little bit about uh, before so yeah. ancestries is a big deal but before we get to that yeah. we might want to talk a little bit about the new ancestry abilities before we talk about all the ancestries or oh, yeah. kind of our favorites yeah. so um so it, and, it and one thing to, to add in here they, they have like a bunch of stuff about ancestries why they've why they call it ancestries now which is kind of a trend to kind of get away from race um they, they they point out here that savage it, all the ancestries in the book are two point ones like the normal races or normal ancestries, um, but savage pathfinders did four points, so they just kind of say, oh, you can do four points. And they talk about like cultural cultures and cultural packages and doing inherent power. So there's a little bit of info there to like make your own ancestries, some ideas. But yeah, let's talk about the actual new added abilities for making your own ancestries. I, there's not a lot, right? I mean, there's no. There's basically looking at page and a half, and it adds some things. There's five new ones, and then two upgraded ones. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I, I don't know how much you want to dig into those. I mean, they there's dark vision now. There's well, we can go through it quickly. I mean, uh, a big thing here is the additional actions, um, which has been upgraded to five and ten points. This was actually first done in the superhero companion. Uh, the new one. So this is a big change because it, originally it was like three points, I think. So an extra two points is huge. So they've, you know, in my opinion, I think it should be four points, but it, it's five and ten now. 
Um, and that's the normal for all of them. Okay, and then uh, there's also bite, which is a modified which is one. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, basically it's just been, um, uh, they gave it a little bit more. It's like cheaper on the offset. It's one point for the basic bite. And then you can increase it for another point to a D6 and you can add AP2 for another point. So they just made bite a little bit uh, <laughs> beefier, I guess, because, you know, compared to claw, it, it was kind of the weakest. And I mean, you could say horns, but I mean, it was kind of the weakest one out of all the natural weapons. So they've kind of buffed it a little bit. Okay. Yep. And then uh, we have breath weapon for two points. Um, yeah. And that, I mean, that's basically, um, you know, almost like one of the arcane powers where you get 2d6 damage, 3d6 with the rays, cone template. Yeah. Um, camouflage at one point or two well, points. Well, I, I want to just talk about, breath, I mean, so yeah, the breath weapon is, a, is a, it's, it's definitely an important thing to have. The cool thing about this one is that it uses athletics. So there was definitely a need for something like this for a lot of the fantasy races, especially like dragon Right, like dragonborn or dragon oh, type sure, characters. Of course. Um, uh, so yeah, it's basically like the power, like you said, but um, it's just an athletics uh, role as a as a limited action. That that's important. It's a, a limited action. So yeah, if, which w I guess we'll, maybe we'll describe it now because a lot of stuff have it. Um, yeah. This was introduced in Pathfinder, Savage Pathfinder, and then kind of not codified, but more like. Uh, I don't know, it, it was in the superpower book too. But when something's a limited free action or limited action, you can only do one of those per turn. But you can do a limited free action and limited action in the same term. But you can only do one of the same type. So you couldn't do two limited free actions or two limited actions. And that pops up a lot in the fantasy book. So um, yeah, whenever we mention that, that's what it means. Just a way of kind of like, you know, keeping it not as powerful as it could be. Yeah, it, it, it definitely... It... So you can't um, use your breath weapon three times at a minus four yeah. penalty, right? It, it limits it to one time. Okay. Uh, keep moving on. Um, then I, you know, I don't know if we need to talk a lot about, but there's camouflage now, um, which which is cool. It it it, it gives you um, it's one or two points, and it can add like a big self bonus, basically like your your skin changes color. So I think camouflage that's a cool one that I didn't even think about. <laughs> Uh, right. Well, I mean, it's well, cool it adds to stealth, right? So yeah, yep. um, cold blooded. Uh, everybody's favorite dark vision. Now, cold blooded is uh, minus three, so yeah. you're subtracting from your agility, strength, and vigor rolls if you're spending uh, time in lower temperatures. So that's actually one that they added is that gives you points back. Is cold blooded? Yeah, it's one of the negative ones. I mean, that's pretty. That's a lot of points back. Um, I mean, again, that's one of the ones that is like pretty specific to a type of game you're playing. I mean, you know, if you're in, if it's anything, in, but like a lot of games don't go into cold environments really, unless it's like a cold based kind of setting or a cold based game. So that is a lot of points back. So GMs just, you know, keep an eye on that one. But I mean, generally the GMs are the one making the races anyways, or ancestries usually. So True. Um, yeah. And then dark vision. So dark vision was also introduced in Savage Pathfinder. And this is a one point ability, just like low light or infravision are both one point. The difference between those, because you kind of seem like they'd have a lot of overlapping, is that um, dark vision is basically like the combination of low light and, and, and infravision, where you kind of ignore all penalties um, to vision, or you subtract, you know, uh, and you, you you ignore all. Uh, I forget what it's called, uh, Carl. Uh, illumination all illumination penalties. penalties. Illumination yeah. penalties. And then you get some di discounts on like invisibility. Col uh, Dark vision does like a lot of that, but it's only within ten inches. So it's kind of like, you know, you have like a for the same amount of point, you have like a better vision ability, but it's in a very limited range. So there's some weird quirkiness there with like some ancestries might have like, especially in Pathfinder and in this one, they might have low light vision, which is like you know, they can see for as far as they can see. But dark vision, other ancestries have that, and it's like they basically have ten inches, and they don't see anything else. So um, <laughs> now the fantasy. So I, I guess it's a good trade-off, you know. Yeah. Now the fantasy companion has dark vision, but it doesn't have all the Pathfinder. Well, it has parts. some of the Pathfinder stuff because there's no there's no um, race creation thing in the Pathfinder. Right. Exactly. Um, so, but but they did they did add some unique things there, like they added dark vision, they added um, fey blooded, or I forget what they called it, like for the elves, they added stone cunning. Um, so there was some new stuff plugged into the like Pathfinder ancestries. Um, like dark vision is here 
And some of the other stuff is actually as edges. So they did pretty much include all the added ancestry abilities from Pathfinder. So Savage Pathfinder is in the Fantasy Companion. And I talk about that in the comparison video. Um, but yeah, you'll see some of the edges are the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then uh, after Dark Vision, we have Diminutive, which <laughs> is uh, two, four, or six. Um, two points for small, four points for very small, six points for tiny. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, in the you kind of had that vibe going in the game we're playing now. <laughs> with yeah, the, my character's a small. He's a he's yep. a little mouse. This one's interesting because it's um, so it's two, four, and six positive points, but it has negatives to it, and that's part of the reason is because being the size penalties are so advantageous. So like a small race can only have a maximum of D eight strength, and they subtract two from their toughness and damage rolls. Um, <laughs> so again, there's like a big limit there, but remember they're getting plus two on pretty much like to hit everything and everything's mm -hmm. getting a minus two to hit them. If as long as they're, you know, zero and then, you know, bigger races, it's even a bigger penalty or a bigger advantage. So there's a lot of advantages to being small, but know that you're probably not going to be a good like melee fighter. And that only gets more intense with very small and tiny races, but this one's very cool. I mean, I think this one really opens up some different ancestries, ancestries don't you think? Oh, it allows you to create some pretty cool stuff that you couldn't create before necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then we got echolocation, which has, for one point, um, it also ignores illumination penalties um, and four points of blindness and visibility um, and other pen pe uh, penalties that are inflicted by sight or illumination. Um, but it's only a point. It only cost a point. Yeah, so. I think part of that maybe because uh, it's a pretty powerful one. This yeah, one's pretty powerful. Point. Again, it's it's within ten inches, so same as Dark Vision, um, but it does actually it's a little bit stronger than Dark Vision, I think, as far as the because um, it's only two points of penalties from invisibility, where with echolocation it's four points of uh, invisibility or even blindness. Yeah. Um, I guess the, the, the downside is there if, is if, you know, if there's some type of sound dampening or something. I don't know. But it's, it's I, I think it's straight stronger than Dark Vision, right? Wouldn't you yeah, agree? Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. why I was surprised it's a point, right? So. Yeah. Um, and then there's phosphorescence. Yep. yep. Um, this is a weird one. It, it, it it's generates. It's positive points. It's positive points. Yeah. One and two. Um, it illuminates two points of illumination penalties in a small, medium, or large blast template. So I guess you can decide. Um, <laughs> but then it like subtracts rolls from stealth from you, and you can deactivate it or activate it as a free action. So that's good. So it's a little bit of a weird like I. I mean, it, generally it's not going to be a good thing for you. I mean, light's pretty easy to come yeah. by, you know, with with like that's why I'm the surprised lights, that's a point. Or, I, I'm surprised that's a positive and not a negative, honestly. So. Um. I mean, I guess because you can turn it off and on as a free action. I mean, the two-point version where you can strobe it is kind of cool because it gives people a negative one to attack you with melee attacks. And it can add plus one to tests if you want to, whatever appropriate. So that one's cool. I'd almost think, like, just make that whole thing the one-point ability, <laughs> you know? But I don't know. And then we have... Uh, and then finally we have... Yeah, go, No, go ahead. Take her over. Take it over. Uh, this, finally, we have Poison Touch that's been upgraded um from the normal version and that's just i think it it it, it sucks into it. i can't remember the, the real reasons i mean you have the spitting of poison for two points it, 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 oh i know what the upgraded version is because it's a one to six positive modifier and you can basically it gives you all these different ways to like customize it so you can make normal mild or disabling poison you can add more points to make it spit and then you can kind of upgrade the the, the poison to knockout paralyzing or even lethal so if you kind of have like max out poison touch with spitting lethal poison, it's a six point positive ability. Um, yeah, very cool. I, I think that's a really cool uh, stuff they added there. That is cool. I, I wish they would have added a couple of uh, negative point ones too. I don't know what they would be. Yeah. Or thought that would be be nice because remember you got to balance these these ancestries and there's a lot of positive. Where's the negatives to balance them out? It'd be nice if they, had, they added a few few more to the list other than the minus three. But, That's okay. true. I mean, the only thing I'd say to that, which is totally true, is that they did add some hindrances, and hindrances can be used to balance out races or ancestries. So I guess you could say there's 
kind of some more negatives there. That's a good point. That's um, an absolutely good it, point. Yeah, the hindrances would come into play there. <laughs> so absolutely, for sure. And, and then so um, they provided, again, these are two-point ancestries. They provided 29 ancestries. So a big list of ancestries you can just kind of grab. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, though, me and Carl, I mean, I know I am. Uh, I think, Carl, you are too, that I think we are both of the mind, especially for like fantasy ancestries and even like science fiction aliens. I actually really like the four point um, ancestries or races now because like often with the two point ones to make when you're in a fantasy or a sci fi setting with a lot of aliens, you have these, you know, this huge variety of different types of ancestries and to really make them different, you have to give them a lot of positive abilities and then you kind of are. A lot of times it feels like you are artificially having to add like like negatives that don't really fit to kind of, you know, make everything balance out like we like outsider. You know, outsider, outsider. yeah, gets, gets like used way too much. I think it can be used well, but I think it's used a lot. So, um yeah, I, I would say my opinion is go for four point uh fantasy stuff. Uh but you know, teach his own, right? Um well, Did you have a favorite same. ancestry? Oh, yeah. sorry, go on. I know, and that's the same thing when we talk about should you start at novice or start at seasoned, right? I mean, it's you can add more capability there at the beginning and give more variety chances by doing that, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Um, but you asked me, do I have a favorite ancestry? And yeah. I went through this list, and, you know, minotaurs I thought were cool, um, good old-fashioned... Um, uh, Elemental scions, I thought were kind of a neat one. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Um, and it, and it depends on which kind of scion you are. Depends on what um, uh, like bonus you get. bonuses, yeah. um, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, those yeah, are the ones cool. that sort of grab me. There's a but. I mean, there's a ton here, right? I mean, there's dragon folk, 29. which was pretty cool, right? <laughs> uh, there's twenty nine. Uh, my exactly. favorite up there. My my favorite was shapeshifters. They did a cool shapeshifter. And they um, they added in a it's kind of a twist on, which I thought was interesting. On the um, you know you can add you can give part of the normal race creation from Swade is you add somebody give somebody the gifted. I mean you can give anybody any edge as part of a race or ancestry creation, right. but there's a specific one for gifted as like a kind of an innate power. Um, but this one they they gave them the gifted, but it's and only with the disguise power with the personal limitation. But it actually set it as a limited free action. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, they kind of buffed it a little bit there. Um, so that's what I thought that was a cool kind of twist on that. Um, and shape shapeshifters are cool anyways. Um, so yeah, that was my favorite. Um, but yeah, I think we, we want to really get into the edges and stuff. So we're going to move right along to the hindrances. Um, yeah, just, I mean, I just, just keep want in to mind, say, there's like something for everybody. You know, the, yeah. Something for everybody there. So, and then as a GM, I would really think you'd want to go through this and pick out the five that really belong in your fantasy campaign and not just allow everything, <laughs> obviously. No, you so. shouldn't allow, obviously not allow obviously, everything. Yeah, so. and that, that's that's a good segue into what I was going to say at the top of hindrances here. For the hindrances and the edges especially, I mean, the, the, I don't, the fantasy companion, what I feel, or I think you agree with me, is like it's really not there to just be like, hand it to the players and just be like, go nuts, you can take everything. Um, it, it's really for the GMs to kind of pick and choose from it to kind of fit with what their idea of their game is or how they want like, you know, quote unquote, their balance of their game to be. Um, so I, I, especially as we're getting into the hindrances and the edges, these are really just not meant to just be like a, you know, a, a yard sale for the, for the players as it were. Um, and, well, and that's the thing. The fantasy yeah. companion is a superset of yeah. fantasy concepts that you can bring into your, your campaign. So it, it's, it's trying to be all encompassing, so you have to slice it out a little bit to make it fit better what you're trying to accomplish. I think personally, so yes, I, mean, I agree. Um, so with the, they've added hindrances. They've added 13 new hindrances. Um, a good chunk of these, I would say, maybe it's like a, a third, are specifically for arcane backgrounds. So we'll talk about that when we go through it. Um, and you know, it, some of these, I, I think you could just take as a player, maybe ask. For them to take it and a lot of these are really meant to be plugged into a specific type of arcane background um so it kind of depends i mean we'll bring it up as we talk about it but that's uh so if you either use the arcane backgrounds you find in the book or you make your own which i've been doing recently i've been doing working on my own fantasy setting um that's what a lot of those are kind of meant for they're not meant to just be taken by anybody and some are more flexible in that way so let's start at the top uh 
Here's one, Carl, that I love this new hindrance. I think it should be part of the core hindrance. I think it's part of core books. It's amorous. Uh, your character just, you know, loves love, I guess. <laughs> and uh, what it does is it's it's a minor hindrance, and it's a minus two penalty to resist test by any character with attractive or very attractive. So, sp I mean, you know, the attractive and very attractive Ed, usually call out, you have to be, you know, it, they get a bonus against them if they be somebody that they're attracted to, either, you know, based on gender or based on, like, you know, a certain type of ancestry. I think with Amorous, it really is... If that person's good looking, you're taking a negative two to test by them. <laughs> so I, I love this one. I think this one is awesome. What do you think? I, I think it's cool. I, you know, again, it, you, you have to lean into it, right? So if you take this, yeah. you take this and the game master's not throwing attractive people at you who are trying to get something from you, it's it's then free money, right? It's It's a free hindrance. So as a game master, you definitely have to take advantage of make your make your game take advantage of it but it's cool it's true it's true. yeah it's cool but you can so. also it's a good role-playing one too i mean you can oh, really yeah. role play it up of like you know being a stand basically of <laughs> people you come across and uh yeah, right? that's the or right word stand yeah, or whatever yeah exactly <laughs> just being that kind of person um yeah all right and then we got arcane sensitivity which is um pretty pretty basic right it says um you know your you're sensitive to arcane energy, and that's you know caused by something, right? It could be you know curse, something, whatever. Um, the minor hindrance subtracts two when making the trait roll um, to resist the power, and that includes arcane creature abilities. Uh, they say GM's call, but um, that it, that would include that in most cases. Yeah. And then subtract four as a major hindrance. So um, it's pretty basic it's what it says and it gives you some mechanical disadvantage which is um perfectly fine yeah i think this one fits this is really well balanced as far as uh, hindrances i mean if you're in a fantasy setting there's probably magic and there's supernatural creatures so this is going to come up a lot uh you shouldn't let somebody use this with the fey blooded edge when we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to that but yeah, I think this is a this is a solid solid hindrance to include in, in a fan, fantasy specific setting. Um, so moving on to armor interference, this is another this is one of the arcane background specific ones. And again, this one is really 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 and this is kind of a holdover from Savage Pathfinder, which used armor interference and armor I forget what it was called, but like armor training or something as like a balancing a balancing for points for the class edges. So. Arm interference was for the arcane ones, and then there was ones for like the the martial classes, like to balance out monk, right? So these are really these are I think really um, there to when you make an arcane background. I don't really see this as one that you take as a player, just you know that like a normal arcane background, and you decide I'm going to have armor interference. Like I guess you could, but it seems pretty cheap to then as a player make this because the player probably wasn't ever planning on wearing heavy armor or whatever because they don't they were never planning on having the strength for it so uh armor interference is really really there for um when you're making an arcane background and basically what it means is that if you're wearing if the minor one you can only wear light armor if you wear anything heavier then you have a minus four to all your arcane skill rolls and you can't use any of the abilities and if it's the major version you can't wear any armor except for cloth you can't wear any light armor or use a light shield um, for the same penalties. So yeah, this one again is really specifically for balancing, I think. Um, but it's it's good to have because uh, you know we have these tropes in our mind of wizards not being in plate mail and stuff. Right. Again, this goes back to it's being a super set. You could have your your fantasy setting be much more Tolkien esque, where wizards are running around with swords and armor and stuff like that. Right. So um, yeah, you just you would make the arcane background yourself um, and then not include it. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Um, and so then the next one is Blunderer, um, which <laughs> this one's a scary one. It's a major, but this, yeah. this basically, you know, it, you're, you're, you're not as good at something you should be good at. Um, you know, so it takes a while for you to master your craft. And if you, the, the, the net of it is if you get a, you can get a critical failure whenever you roll a one, not two ones, just the one on the skill die. So if you're a spellcaster, because you're a wizard and you have this, um, you have this hindrance, and so you're rolling spell casting. If you get a one on your skill die, that's a critical failure versus yeah. on both of them. So this one uh, definitely is major. Uh, this can oh, it's major, major. This one's yeah. this one's a little harsh, and you major can also role play it. Yeah, yeah. 
and, and this one specifically, you have to set it to a skill. That's one of your main kind of yep. skills. So this is one that GMs really make sure that they're setting it to the appropriate skill players because, um, you know, if your fighter takes it for persuasion and they're not really that, you know, they might use it occasionally, that's still not good enough. It has to be for fighting. Um, so whatever is like a central skill, that's what they set it to. And know that like it's just the skill die to a one. So you could you could have succeeded with your wild die, but then it becomes a critical failure. So this one's very harsh. Yeah, uh, it's, just it's, <laughs> FYI. Yeah, it's definitely definitely falls into that major category. I think it would just it it would be more interesting if if this is like a character concept where this has to be part of the character concept, and you're planning on buying it off later or something like that. So perhaps yeah, that's true because like they're. Yeah, they've been clumsy, or they're they've had they've learned like a slow learner for yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, next one is corruption. This is another one that's arcane background specific. Um, this one I, I could see a player taking it. it it's depending on, on the arcane background they have. If they uh, if it fits the flavor, you know, if you have an arcane background that's very specific, then probably wouldn't fit. If you have kind of a more open ended arcane background, this could fit. Basically, what this is is it says that it's your magic draws on like a foul or corrupted source. Um, I also, I use this one, so I'll just describe what it does first. Uh, when you get a critical failure on your arcane skill roll, they gain a minor hindrance. Or they upgrade one of the minor hindrances they already gained to a major hindrance. This is kind of like to show like a de degradation of their mind or spirit or sanity, right? Um, and basically these last until uh, they get, the person gets the next advance, at which time they can remove a minor hindrance or reduce a major to a minor. So this is just to really show that like, uh, you know, when they critically fail the, the spell casting because it drew on this foul source, it kind of corrupts them in some way. Um, you could expand this a little bit. Like I'm using this for my um, one of my custom arcane backgrounds that I made from scratch called Mystic, which is kind of like a medium type thing. And they don't actually they, they mainly deal with like good spirits, but I've kind of said that there is these evil and mischievous spirits, and they kind of can sneak in when the person critically failures. So you can kind of use this in other ways, but um, like I said, this one is another one that's really specific for an, a certain flavor of Arcane Background, and um, it only kind of fits, if a player's taking it, if like, you, you know, you're just using like the basic suede ones, and it's like magic, and they're like, well, I I talk to a demon or something. Uh, so it's, it's an interesting one, right? Don't you think? I, th I think it brings a lot of flavor in. Oh, I, I think it's... it's um... I think it's pretty cool. I mean, uh, you know, we talk about the the necromancers and those people who have art, you know, yeah. are evil, quote unquote, uh, are tainted. This is this is something that you can use to help drive that that descent into evil, I guess. I don't know, right? I mean, evil so, or madness or, or madness, yeah. you know, the racelands from Dragonlance kind of <laughs> yeah, yeah, going yeah, on yeah, there, so. Sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, then the next one we got cursed, which is you've crossed some dark power somewhere and they've cursed you. And uh, basically the mechanical is any beneficial magical power is intended for you um, are at a minus two penalty to the arcane skill roll of the person of the person who's trying to help you. And if they get a critical failure, the caster is stunned. So the yeah, the caster the is caster. stunned. Yeah, yeah. Not you. <laughs> the caster is stunned. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no. That's that's the uh, um, so that's a that's a major hindrance that affects the party. <laughs> yep, for sure. So um, I don't know if how much. And it can affect them you. if they're in an area effect. Yep. Uh, it, they kind of took this out of arcane resistance and made it worse. I personally don't like this one. I don't like. I, I don't. Th I mean, beyond role playing a hindrance, I don't think that you should have mechanical things that are going to really hurt other players. That's just my opinion, though. Um, I, yeah, uh, I think I, you could I probably agree. drop the whole like critical failure, their stun thing, and then maybe put this to a minor. I just I don't like that part personally. Yeah, uh, I don't, I don't think you your hindrances uh, should mechanically impact someone else generally. Yeah, 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 because um, you're choosing them, not someone else. And I mean, but of course, you know, the flip side, somebody could say nobody said that the person has to help. Right? They could say, it's well, true. no, I'm not going to buff you because that minus, you know, I could. I could stun myself, so you're the last one that I'm going to spend buff points on while I'm helping out the rest of the party. You know, so. Right. Yeah, yeah, like I said. So I, I, my my thing, I'd probably just take out that stun effect and maybe drop it to a minor hindrance. 
Um, yeah, moving on to Doom. Doomed! Uh, this one is basically, you know, death is coming for you. And it's, it's a major hindrance, and it pretty much just you subtract two from your soak rolls. Uh, so pretty... This one should be, obviously... I feel like this one should be a, another base Savage Worlds hindrance. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's... I don't really talk about that much. It's subtract two from soak rolls. I... I it's certainly a major one, I guess, because soak rolls are really important, but it's the one that's not maybe going to come up all the time, and it's hard to role-play. I mean, I, I think, like, a lot of the ones we've talked about for this, there's a lot of cool role-playing opportunities there. Even though um, it's mechanical. Like and Blunderer and Amorous, but Doomed, yeah, I don't know. I Pretty mean, it is what it is. Yeah. It's a major, so. Yeah. Uh, then we have Grim, which uh, is a minor, but what's kind of fun about that is, you know, you're, you're, you're Grim. You're very serious, and, you know, you're... You're easily provoked. So the whole mechanical... I, like, I like how it says they find mirth tiresome. <laughs> That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're very dour. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and it's different from being mean. They're not mean, right? Uh, so, if they're, so they're provoked on any successful taunt. Um, yes. And that's whether the opponent has the provoke edge or not. So, you know, yeah. when you're provoked, right, you get that minus two from rolls that affect an opponent, except the one that you're provoked against that insulted you. Um, yeah. And that lasts till Joker is drawn or someone else does the, the taunts you. Um, yeah. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting one. It's definitely good for minor. Um, it also counts for the menacing edge. So it's another one that's there for menacing, which I like a lot. I like this one a lot. It's, it's a minor hindrance. I think there's, um, why mechanically it might not seem that strong because how often do people get taunted necessarily in games? Like from, you know, from the, the, jet, the game master taunting players. Uh, but it's also a lot of cool role-playing opportunities there. So I like this one a lot. I think this one's really cool. And I, again, I think this one should be in the base Savage Worlds. Oh, I agree. Um, I agree. It's, it's, a good, it's a good minor hindrance to, to take advantage of. Yeah. Uh, moving on, we have Idealistic. This is a minor one. This is basically just the person is idealistic. I mean, they don't see things... They see things only in black and white. They don't really... They're kind of innocent in a lot of ways to the world. Um, they kind of... But uh, yeah, so, you know, they, 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 it says here they have like a trouble over like moral dilemmas. So, um, like, do you hand the, you hand the poor thief that, you know, somebody was like starving, they stole bread. Do you hand them over to the guard or do you get, let them get away? This one I feel like is there's already pretty much represented in the core suede hindrances, like, um, uh, the code of honor maybe, or, uh, I forget. So there's some other ones that I feel oh, like kind of cover it. Things like that. Maybe. It could be a quirk, so but I guess it's fine. It's it's pretty much a role playing one. I think we're yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any mechanical to that at all. So no. um, then there's jingoistic, which is a minor and a major, which is all about you disliking people not of your culture, and that doesn't just mean, <laughs> you know, could mean like barbarians versus city dwellers. It, yeah. You know, it doesn't necessarily mean different countries or cultures. It can be anything where you would you feel superior. Um, the minor, the targets. You can't benefit the, the, the folks that you um, don't like <laughs> can't benefit from the command edges um, and really can't stop from being a jerk to them, I suppose. And so you get a minus two in your persuasion rolls when interacting with them. And then for the major, it just the penalty increases to minus four. So the, the bottom line is if you're with somebody who you think is um, beneath you, um, you can't help them with command, and you you're gonna have a hard time persuading them because you're basically gonna be in you know giving them left backhanded compliments or whatever. Um, that's not really yeah. that. It's, so it it would be I don't know. It, it's an interesting. It'd be great for role playing, but it could be very um, triggering. It could get tiresome. Yes, you know. To have, I completely have this agree. I don't like this one. I mean, they really made it specific. They really made it like it's other cultures. It's not other races or other ancestries because that would, you know. But it's it's kind of walking that line a little bit. And like you said, it would kind of get tiresome after a while, I think. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, the my, it, yeah, I, I, don't, I just don't really like it. I think you could do this with just your own backstory and role playing and kind of play it more flexibly without actually having it codified as a specific hindrance like this. So I, I personally don't like this one. I, th I don't think it's a good addition and I probably wouldn't include it in, in my own games. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, 
it, it's more what your character is versus um, kind of how they interact with the world versus having it as an actual hindrance. But I, I yes. guess, yeah, so. And you could have, like, arrogant. You could have, like, a quirk of, like, they're it a could noble be mean, or something. You know, I mean, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of do. ways you can encourage this and just with your backstory. But, yeah. Okay, so moving on to material components. This is a major hindrance. This is another arcane background only one. This one you could is another. This one is more flexible. Like I said before, some are kind of spe very specific to an arcane background. I think this one can be taken by arcane backgrounds that don't have this already. This one is brutal for casters. I'll just say that this one is the most one of the most brutal ones here. Basically, if you ever get a critical failure, now they don't specifically state this, Carl. Um, uh, uh, it just says. They run out of they run out of it if they ever get a critical failure, but I, but but I'm assuming it means a critical failure on your arcane skill die. So they don't state oh, yeah. that. That has to be. Yeah, that has they to be. They don't say it though, but you know, it'd be a critical failure for anything would be way too harsh. It doesn't make sense. So basically what it means is that you have to have like actual material components. And um uh if you're if it says if and you have like a pouch, if they if the caster's ever stripped of it then she reduces all arcane skill rolls by four. That's huge. That's a negative four on all arcane skill rolls. And then they can restore it by paying 50 gold piece times rank at a shop or a day's worth of foraging with a survival roll per rank, basically. So pretty expensive to, to kind of redo and it would suck. I mean, minus four is a huge penalty. And like I said, if you get a critical failure, then you run out of stuff. You just Anytime you get a critical failure, you just completely run out and you're empty. So this is a really, really big one. Um, but you know, if a player wants to take this, good for them. <laughs> like this one, I think you could take with any kind of arcane background. You could kind of make it make sense. Um, so yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah what do you I, think? It's, it's a tough one. You're, you're setting yourself up for some pain when you're in the middle of yes. your dungeon delve and you roll. <laughs> so, um, and it's not really a role. There's not really any role play. Um, excuse no, me. it's all any role play it's, opportunities yeah, yeah. there. It's all mechanics. Yeah. And then, the, the speaking of, uh, role play, the next one is selfless. Um, which is major or minor. Um, and this is, you think of everybody before yourself, you know, they eat first, you'll sleep on the floor to give them a bed. These are some of the examples they give. Um, and it's, it's, prime, it's all role-playing. There's no mechanical. It's, and it says the extent and frequency of your sacrifice determines whether it's minor or major. So that is about as uh, um, open to interpretation as <laughs> yeah. one can get. Um, so uh, I think... The game master and the player have to be on the same page as to what a sacrifice means, um, and yeah. it's all it's all role playing um, on this one. There's no mechanical aspect of it at all. So, yeah, this one, I, I it's another one I don't really like. I feel like th there's suede hindrances already do this, like heroic comes to mind, or vow, or code of honor, or whatever the. There's a lot of them that already accomplished this. This is probably the most open-ended one for having a minor and a major, don't you think? Like, I, yeah. this, this one's a little tricky to me because, like, well, where's the line between minor and major here? They, there's not really good examples in there. Uh, so, so I so feel minor, like this one would be really... Minor, you let them eat first. Major, you jump in front of the bullet, I guess. But, I don't but know. that's <laughs> also heroic, right? So, yeah. like, I, I, I don't... <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you never take money. You give all your money away, like... It, I don't know. There, there's kind of like a, a too much convolu convolu convoluted a little bit too much, I think. And there's already ones that already accomplished it, accomplished this. Uh, so I, this, is another, this is another one that I don't really like um, just because of those reasons. Finally, we have Talisman. This is major or minor. Basically, it means that you have to have like a physical. This is another arcane background specific one. This is, a, this is one that's flexible where you can give it into an arcane background or somebody could technically take it if they needed to this is this could be anything from like a holy symbol to a staff um i use this one a lot in my custom setting with my custom arcane backgrounds to kind of add into things but basically it means as a minor one uh you have you it's like you have some type of physical thing that you have to hold or have on you Darn and um, like a staff or an orb or a holy symbol like i said yeah and it's an if you if you don't have it so it gets stolen you lose it it's a minus one from your arcane skill rolls or it's a minus two as a major hindrance and uh, you're stunned if you roll a critical failure. And then replacing it, they kind of leave it up to, there's no like hard and fast rule here. It's just kind of up to the game master and you to decide. So this one's good. I mean, if you compare it to material components, like <laughs> it's way better. Uh, it's right, like, what, I, what I mean is way less harsh, the major version. It's a minus two and it's not as easy to lose it, right? Because um, the only kind of negatives with this is when you technically lose the talisman. So this one might be a little bit on the weaker side, where something like material components is a little bit on the stronger side, comparing the two major hindrances. 
Yeah, um, and, I, yeah. and I see this Any one. Other thoughts? Well, I could see this one leading to some uh, arguments. Honestly, it's like, how, so the the bad guy goes after your your staff, and it's like, well, why would he go after my staff? What what? <laughs> It's like, well, yeah. well, because we know that you're talisman and he would take that from you. No, it's no, he wouldn't know. It's just my staff. You know, I, I feel like this one would lead to maybe elicit some. Yeah. Yeah. Per personally, that, I, I that, think it would be that's tough. a really good point. I think then if you're a game master and somebody takes this, then you should be saying like, well, I'm going to sometimes target you or think effects are going to happen because otherwise they'll never get the, the negative of this. And it's almost like free hindrance. Right. Um, so, yep. yeah. So overall, I think I like the hindrances. There's not a ton here. I really like the inclusion of all the arcane background specific ones. Those are the big win here to kind of, you know, give a lot more flavor right. to arcane backgrounds because when you give them negatives, you can give them more positives. So it's a good like trade-offs here. Um, some of these I think are, a couple of them I think are just good overall for suede completely. And I think a couple of these are, I don't really like, and I think are, they, they pretty much just like, you know, they already kind of do them in suede. They kind of just put them in there to kind of maybe fluff up the numbers a little bit. So it's it's a little bit of a mixed bag, I would say, right? Is that what you would... No, I, I totally agree. I, you, you said okay. everything exactly the way I was going to say it. There's some good ones that I think should be in the core book or should be used all the time. Some are really cool if you've got magic in your... You want to make magic more interesting in your, yeah. in your setting. So, yeah. Um, and a few, it's like, yeah, whatever. I'll take them or leave them, so... Okay, cool. So we're moving on from hindrances. Now, before we get to the edges, there's just a couple of little sections here. They, they, they have a whole page of quote unquote classes where basically they say, we don't do classes, but if you want to do kind of like an archetypal class, like barbarian or ranger right. or sorcerer or whatever, they kind of give you examples of edges. So that's a cool little thing they've added in. Um, yeah. Moving on to uh, skills, they've added the alchemy skill, which is both used by the alchemist arcane background that they include that we'll talk in a later video. Um, it's also just used for anything that you, when you make alchemy or you want to identify al um, alchemical things, it's used in place of science. And then they have a little thing here where they talk about animal handling, where um, they say they just use persuasion. And if you can speak with them, it's a plus two. They didn't want to give it a new skill. Now, I do a little bit twist on this in my own setting, but it's there. So just kind of. Yeah, touching on those things. And then they have a little thing where they talk about ancestral edges that you can... Uh, they don't have any specific ancestral edges, but you can clearly tell that some of these are kind of geared towards certain ancestry. So again, GMs, when you're making... Um, when you're making your setting, then, you know, keep an eye out that some of these probably work better as ancestry edges. Um, and, like, when I make a setting, and, like, the one I'm doing, I have a, a whole Ancestry Edge section, and I have a specific edge for each Ancestry. I have one edge, just to kind of give a little more flavor. All right. Uh, let's start with edges. <laughs> uh, yeah. So. I'll go first. Arcane you go first. backgrounds. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just we can move to... on from that one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh no, no, it's your uh, turn. that's a normal you, one. You take on yeah. the rest of them. I got mine done. Okay. I'll, I'll... <laughs> uh, so we have arcane resistance and improved arcane resistance. These are modified from the original version. What they've done now is they've taken away the negative arcane resistance. So before, um, arcane resistance it, it basically gives you a, people, a minus two to target you with powers, um, and re damage was reduced by two. The negative part of it was that included allied powers as well had a minus two to affect you. Again, the memorize said they took this out and put it out to arcane sensitivity. So they basically made it stronger. I'm okay with it. I think they upped the spirit. I'm not sure if the spirit D8 was the same, but you know, arcane resistance, now it's a good edge. So, oh, oh up at the top too, sorry. Um, I am gonna give some light ratings here. Cause again, we're doing this for players and for game masters. So Savage Rolls is not about perfect balance. Take everything we take, <laughs> say as a grain of salt. Uh, but generally when I give ratings, you know, uh, like a C is a niche one, a B is an okay one, A is a really good one, and S, S tier is just over, like very powerful. Um, so we'll give, and with S ones, I might give like my little quick pack, you know, that I think. Um, but yeah, Arcane Resistance, right? A good edge, and now it's stronger. Okay. Um, then, uh, uh, then we have Chosen, which is a give and take kind of edge. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you when you have the chosen, so that means you're destined for greatness. You've been picked by some, you know, uh, divine intervention, whatever it is. But uh, you're you're chosen to do great things. And whenever you spend a conviction, 
So obviously you'd want to be using that in the setting. It lasts until the end of the counter, and the counter without uh, having to maintain it with Benny. So you don't have to keep spending a Benny. You just spend your conviction. It just lasts. The negative, you get a enemy as a major hindrance, and you have uh, sort of a mark that identifies you to those looking for you. So it gives a little, it takes a little, and, and what's interesting in the, the, the description, there's a big paragraph on all the negatives, um, what that means as far as the narrative goes and that, and then the actual benefits is oh, a short paragraph. You spend your conviction, yeah. <laughs> you, get, you get to do it for up. So I, I don't know how I feel about, about that. It seems that you get, um, again, the game master would have to bring that enemy to bear on occasion, um, make it so it hurts. But um, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of uh, edges that give you some benefit and then they give you some other huge negative uh, related to it. So, Yeah, this one's a weird one. I think if you're a player, <coughs> clear with your GM. If you're a game master, take a really look at this. I think you'd really have to work with the player and accept that they're gonna have, you're going to add in this major enemy. Um, as far as writing this one, I, I mean... Uh, you know, I mean, I, enemy majors are fun to me. Um, the distinctive appearance is fun. So I think this one is definitely, you know, having to not spend bennies and conviction is pretty powerful. So I give this one an A. I mean, as far as like mechanics, even with the disadvantages that it has, I mean, you're, it, but it, you know, it really varies because the GM can really harp on you a lot for this or not. But I, I still think that, I think that I do think the flavor is cool, but it's something that you really have to work out with the game master if they want to have this in. So this one's a weird one. Yeah, um, for sure. Moving on to Fey Blood. This one was uh, first introduced as a elf and half elf um, arc, uh, ancestry ability in Savage Pathfinder. Basically, you get a free rerolls against powers or supernatural abilities, like effects. Um, yeah, I mean, they say it here elves, half elves, and Fey, but there's, there, you could also, you know, you don't have to, you could totally take this and put it to some other type of ancestry. Um, this one is very much a game master edge, I think. I think this one is one that you put in for a certain ancestry. Um, or you have it as an ancestry edge, um, linked to whatever ancestry that the kind of, that would make sense for. I do think it's cool. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, rating it, I think it's, it's a, it's a solid, <laughs> I don't know, like a B plus, I think a minus a, uh, getting free rules is pretty, I would say it's like a B. I mean, yeah. Free rerolls are always on nice. This? Free roll, yeah. re rolls are always nice for sure. And speaking of uh, re-rolls, uh, then you also next have Favored Enemy, which is you, you fought somebody so much that you kind of know the ins and outs of this enemy and what happens. Um, build it into your backstory, work with the Game Master, but the mechanics of it is you get a free re-roll when rolling track, um, rolling when you're tracking them, survival or attacking, which is shooting, fighting, um, athletics. Throwing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, athletics. Um, and then that, I mean, it's good. Free reroll is good. It's uh, the only limit. I mean, it's kind of limited in the fact that it's a chosen enemy and you'll have to work out how big of a pool a chosen enemy is. Um, you know, is it purely like an orc or is it orc kind? And that can includes you know, half works and stuff. like. You know what I mean? I, it, 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 you have yeah. to work that oh, out. Oh, no, it, it definitely is tricky. And they, and they specifically say ancestries, uh, specific ancestries. Um, yeah, this one I, you know, I talked about this in the, one of the Savage Pathfinder videos. I do have issues with this and kind of the same issues that comes up in 5e and comes up in 1e Pathfinder. Uh, this can either be a really, really good edge, almost overpowered, if it's, you know, if you're in just an undead pretty much only campaign and you choose undead, then it becomes overpowered or it becomes super niche and they don't fight them that much. So this is one definitely to talk about with your GM. Like I said, I personally don't like it. I, uh, my fix for this one is what I did personally. I don't think everybody should, but I, I changed it for my setting is I took away any type of specific enemy and I basically just said it's a limited action and you kind of uh, focus in on a single enemy. Um, as a limited action. So they have to spend an action and then they get these benefits on them. Or they have to see tracks and they can and they can like get the rerolls on the tracks. Uh, so it makes it a little bit more, it's pretty much universal at that point, but in combat, there's an action economy um, payment they have to pay. So that's my kind of play on it. And I was inspired from Pathfinder 2E, which what they did with their Ranger. 
Um, so yeah, again, this this one is very hard to rate because it can either be an S tier edge or it can be a C edge, depending on <laughs> you know your setting, like Carl said. And no, you don't get you don't get rerolls for all athletics, just throwing. I, that's the only reason I was bringing up throwing is because you don't get it for like grappling and stuff like that, just for throwing. Oh yeah, well, that's um, what I so said when you're strong. when you're attacking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, cool. So now favorite terrain. Again, that was taken from the Ranger and Savage Pathfinder. Now the other part of a Ranger from Savage Pathfinder is favorite terrain. This one, you choose a specific terrain type. And you get, um, while you're in that terrain, so you pick like hill or forest, you get free rerolls on survival and all survival rolls and notice rolls. And you draw an additional action card um, in, in the terrain that can be on top of things like uh, level headed. Um, and you can take it multiple times. So this one is, again, similar to Favorite Enemy. Um, I do think that it's not as OP if you're just, like, in a forest. Um, but, you know, this one is definitely one you want to bring up with your GM and be like, I'm going to choose forest. Will I have a chance to use this? Right. Because it's another one that, like I said with the Ranger, is that, like, you know, if you're from the Arctic, and so you'd say, okay, it makes sense that I would have Favorite Train Arctic, and then you never go into the arctic then it's really not worth that much so i think the only fix here i would have is that if you have like favorite train arctic but then your character's spending a lot of time like in the setting in like a forest you know area that you could be like at, at when they when they level when they get a new rank or advance they're able to switch it to a new uh terrain or you could do something like they spend conviction they spend with their conviction to switch to a new terrain that they've spent time in so that, that at least gives it some more flexibility that would be my only fix uh what are your thoughts on this I I think it's just it's too specific. Um, so again, yeah. you know, it, you either get tons of benefits because it's a you know uh, forest based, you know, you're in the forest all the time, and so you're always getting this penal benefit, or you're in a city and then you had forest, and so you never get it. So it's, yeah. it's a little too hit and miss. Um, but uh, you know, this I, as a game master, I wouldn't disallow it. I would just let the, no, the players way, yeah. have that and say, <laughs> you know, just keep in mind you're picking aquatic and you live in a desert planet. So just keep that in mind, player, that you know, there's going to be a limited number. <laughs> Might not of use chips. it. Yeah. yeah. So um, then the next one is heirloom, which I got kind of mixed emotions about personally. This this edge grants the hero the ability to have one magic item chosen from a list in the book that uh, has a value of 10,000 gold pieces uh, with a total value of 10,000 gold pieces uh, each time the edge is taken. So it even talks about taking the edge more than once. Um, I, uh, it says it's a one-time benefit. If the item's destroyed or it's consumable, it, it goes away. But it, it feels like that's, you know, it's kind of the game master's call, right? To yeah. say, here's here's something. I mean, I'd almost rather let people have it if part of their backstory than make them use an edge or allow edges to push me to provide that. So I'm kind of torn on this one. Um, it's it's yeah. I, I don't know. I, I I'd probably just work with the players, and if it makes sense for them to have a powerful magic item, they got a powerful magic item. Um, but then the flip side is, don't take the edge and expect that this is gonna somehow happen in the middle of gameplay that's my no this one's definitely on it, so. i mean you know they took away and swayed the whole background being only a character creation uh but background edges are certainly uh, out of all the edges they really need a lot of role-playing stuff in them if you take them later so they have to be you have to be like ahead of time maybe tell the gm and be like i'm working towards this or can i have this so background edges you know they're not closed off to being only at the beginning but they still have that thread a bit you know um, yeah, heirlooms I've definitely mixed on too. I think it's something that's cool that maybe you're you're like, okay, everybody gets this edge uh, because of whatever reason, right? Or you're all like chosen, or you all get this, or you're well, from the you aristocratic family. Right? And, and yeah, you don't you even, even need, need the edge. edge. You just give yeah. people, <laughs> give them the thing and call it good, you know? So um, Definitely one to look out for as a GM. Okay, now we're moving into the combat edges. I say a lot of these combat edges, I think, should just be in Core Suede. So even oh, I if agree. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even if you, do, you know, like that, that's. It, if you're on the fence about getting the fantasy book, I still think you should get it if you if you do a lot of your own settings, even modern settings and other type of things, because there's a lot of good stuff in here that can be taken into other settings. So start up with charge. Um, basically, if you run at least five inches, you get plus two on damage on your first fighting attack, and it can be combined with a wild attack. This one's pretty weak. I'm not gonna lie. I, I almost want to give this like a C. Uh, as far as like for players, I mean it it's plus two damage when you're only running. I mean I guess like I might bump it up to a B. But plus two damage could be something but i mean there's a lot of other ways you can get damage bonuses and so 
Yeah, I mean, it's kind of cool with the wild take. I, I guess I'll keep it up at B because they, they do hand out damage so rarely. And it's, you know, it is pretty consistent. You can pretty much run a lot of the time when you get to a new enemy. Um, so maybe this is something good to take with like, a, you know, your a pace increases for however you can get it. Um, and, and it's a seasoned, so. Yeah, it is seasoned, like a lot of the, the these combat edges, right? Um, um, so cool. then we have uh, close fighting, which is an office edge. <laughs> and so this is if you uh, have a small weapon, uh, like a knife uh, or something similar that the GM allows um, as a free action, uh, each turn, you can pick a target, and then for the attacks against that target, um, or your parry, so attacks and parry with this foe uh, are increased by the target's reach. It's not just plus, plus one. one, it's the reach plus one. Ah, um, uh, so, yeah. So if if they got a spear, then you get uh, like a long weapon, then you get a, an additional benefit. But the whole point is you got a small little knife and you're in close, and so you're adding yeah. a plus one to your attacks, and your parry is plus one as the foe's trying to use a bigger weapon to try to get around you. It's kind of cool. It's a novice. Um, it doesn't have a huge amount of benefit, but it's, I mean, I could definitely see that being, you know, plus one is nothing to sneeze at, so. I, lo I, I love this one. I think it's really cool. It's not the most powerful one, but it, I, I like how it's um, adding to the specific kind of fighting style, and it really brings a reason for somebody to use like daggers or um um i think it could even be unarmed uh, uh it says right? it says a knife or similar small weapon yeah so i would say you could be probably unarmed um for this benefit too so i really it really does expand on having kind of using smaller weapons and uh so i, I love it and you have to like get into range of them to do it you have to get within their reach yeah. reason so, for really, the dagger really cool. to exist <laughs> Yeah, and I would say, like, mechanically, I mean, again, depends on what your GM's using, but I, I think it's a, it's a solid B mechanically, but I'd say A because of the kind of combat stuff that it um, encourages and really gives advantages to these other ones. And, and um, the, approved, the improved version of it gives you a plus two instead of the plus reach, one. It's the reach plus two. So, yeah, it's the reach plus yeah, two. Somebody has a reach of one, you get a plus three to, to fighting and parry. So really, really cool. Yeah. Um, then we're moving on to Defender. This one is if you uh, <laughs> it, you can basically if you have a shield you can share your parry and the cover bonus with somebody as a free action, uh, not even a limited free action, just a free action. Uh, so you're not losing yours, which is cool. Um, this one's really good. Shields are really powerful, uh, so I give this one an A, honestly, in that it's a free action. Um, I, I personally, this one's really very strong. Excuse me, not OP. But uh, yeah, parry and cover bonuses, sign me up. Um, and again, really adds into a certain play style of defender type play style. Yeah, for sure. I I I can I'd love the uh, the tactical ad addition that this brings to combat. Yeah. Um, and that you don't lose your own bonus is like right. that really makes it in a solid A category. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, then we have dirty fighter. Pretty basic. It just means that uh, the way you fight, you'll do anything to win, and so you get a plus two on your rolls when performing a test with the fighting skill. So you know you're you're a dirty fighter, so you get that bonus. Not much else there. And there's really yeah. So dirty fighters has been a whole, in a lot of Savage World settings, but this is a different version. Um, before it was like if you did a fighting and a test, then you would get a plus two. On like the fighting role or something in the same turn and then the improved one was like you don't you ignore them all to action panel i don't remember it exactly but it's been in stuff like the buccaneer like some of the the seafaring ones and i remember it was in like rifts or I, I don't remember it's been in a bunch of settings but they've changed it here so um I, yeah this one's cool just a plus two doing a test with fighting skill and then the really dirty fighter is if you get a raise on the test then you gain the drop on them uh <laughs> which is nice uh, that would be pretty good until the foe is no longer shaken so um, because when you get a raise on a test, they're shaken. So, yeah, this is really good. I like this one better than the older versions. Again, it's really adding into a certain type of play style. But, you know, again, and a lot of these have been melee. Have you noticed these have all been melee, right? And melee does need that boost. Um, so I, I love these ones. These ones should be in core suede. Uh, I, I think a fighters doing tests with fighting, we talked about this in our test video that we did, and I talked about the fighting skill. Um, well, range is the most, um, probably the most, like, uh, 
reliable. Now this one pushes fighting up there, and fighting has a lot of options. Like you can choose feint. So there's a lot of options here to like make a tricky fighter. So I give these ones solid A's, both of them. I love these ones. Um, double shot. This is for bows, basically for shooting or thrown weapons. Basically allows you to do two uh, attacks uh, with one action. Um, so it's, it's a limited action. So you can't do this obviously multiple times and you roll two shooting dice or two athletics dice instead of one. There's no recoil penalties or anything. And they, they, they hit and uh, do damage separately. And it's just like any other rate of fire weapon where the wild die can replace one of them. So you don't get like two separate it's, rolls with two separate wild dies. You know, it's like rate of fire two on a gun. It's, it's right? frenzy for bow and arrow. Yeah, frenzy for bow and arrow. Basically. Really good to have. This is needed. This is needed without guns. And another really cool one. So I, I, I would say this is an A, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. For sure. And then the improved, the improved double shot um, can use the edge twice per turn. So just like Frenzy and Improved Frenzy. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Solid A. Uh, formation Fighter. Uh, um, another, another cool one. I think yeah, another cool one uh, you increase. So basically when you're adjacent to somebody, your, uh, your gang up bonus is increased by one for both what you give to people and what you get from allies. Uh, but it's still the number, the normal plus four. This one's good because like, if you don't have a lot of melee people, then it's kind of hard to get gang up bonuses. Um, so yeah, I mean, this one I would say is like a B Mm -hmm. um, I mean, plus ones are good, but you don't always are in the, you know, it, it depends how many melee people are in there with you. Um, uh, it, it's almost like, <laughs> this one's almost like, I know it's like supposed to be like a formation, like a phalanx, but I almost see this as like a rogue type of uh, edge too, of like, you know, you're getting like a bonus. That gang up's increased because you're getting in like somebody's blind side, kind of like flanking, right? It's basically flanking. Oh, yeah. So, um, but it also gives people bonuses. So that's why I think it's a solid B for me. Um, yeah. I agree, I agree. Um, and then uh, Shield Wall adds plus one to the parry, Jason, one ally, who also has the Shield Wall edge, and a plus two for two adjacent allies with the edge. So um, that's where you talk about the more for a Shield Wall versus um, some other way. Um, then yeah. we got Martial Flexibility, which comes well, right I, from... I, oh, go ahead, you want to finish I, up on I that? I just wanted to say Shield Wall, you need Formation Fighter first for Shield Wall. This one to me is like pretty niche, unless like if everybody's taking it, then it's good. So that's why it's a C edge, a C edge for me, just because it's like really niche and it really depends on if you're the only one with the shield, then it's worthless, right? Even with somebody, one other person with the shield, it's probably not that good. Right? It's for a particular kind of party, for sure. Party that have a lot, that are all having shields, and that's almost a little too strong, anyways. So yeah, sorry. Yeah. Carry on with martial flexibility. Oh no, that's fine. Um, with martial flexibility. Uh, this is basically comes right out of the the fighter in um, Pathfinder. Savage Pathfinder. Savage yeah. Pathfinder. Um, which once per encounter as a free action, the fighter can choose to gain the benefits of a single combat edge. Exactly the same thing. Has to yeah. meet all the requirements of the edge, um, and the benefits of the edge um, end after five rounds. So essentially, you know, fast furious combat. Five rounds is a long time. So you can pick right at the beginning of the combat. Uh, a new combat edge as long as you meet the requirements. Right, straight from uh, kind of the Savage Pathfinder fighter um, class edge. Yeah, class edge. Yeah, yeah, it's the basic class edge. This one's weird, and we've talked about it before, but, uh, you know, it. you would think it'd be a solid A edge because it's basically any other combat edge, right? And it has that flexibility, and it's it's better than just taking, like, you could take, you know, Frenzy, or you could take Martial Flexibility, and really on paper, I mean, you know, it does end after five rounds. Um, but generally, combat doesn't always go above five rounds. The reason why I think this is more of a B edge, uh, just because that, I mean, it really depends on the player. Because this can slow things down. I, I've seen it being used, and it can slow things down if the player's like, well, what edge? Oh, let me look through all the edges. You really have to have, the player has to be the kind of person who, like, Maybe even writes down here are my solid edges that I like, and then they choose from them. Yeah. Like, so I, just 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 an FYI can slow down combat. And so I did a I, so I did my um, I did a Dragonlance uh, campaign yeah. for um, or I did a Dragonlance uh, for a convention and I a one shot yeah yeah I let them have martial flexibility but I literally had a sheet that had all the combat edges that I would allow 
um, mm. with what they sort of the the summary that you would get in the, the core book that showed you know the the edge and then its implications and say okay here's five that you meet all the requirements for that you can yeah. go ahead and pick at the beginning of combat so they're not searching around and they have that summary so if your player does that that'll work out well if they don't then like you said it's going to slow everything down um, so some yeah so some of the things here you can kind of to shift it around I, I think like you said you could do it like they get a pool of edges they can choose from maybe like two plus their rank so they start with four edges maybe it's seasoned um, and then to kind of pump it up a bit after that uh, they, you can also put on that if they spend a Benny they can do it they can kind of maintain it for another five rounds almost like a power so those are kind of my personal fixes that I generally do just to kind of make it easier to do and then you know because you're kind of nerfing it a little bit give them the ability to, main, to maintain it five more rounds uh, by spending a Benny because that's you know I think that's you know if you look at like a power that's five power points to maintain the thing so I don't think that's actually that bad right if you look at like uh, Warrior's Gift um, kind of does the same thing so i think that's kind of in line um cool so uh missile deflection which is a heroic edge um this one is as long as you have a melee weapon or you have the martial arts edge then uh physical range attacks um like small things or like powers with physical trappings like if somebody's a rock bender <laughs> uh you know somebody fires rocks at you um uh, you can use your parry as the base target number uh, so really, so you know, normally when you do a range attack, it's just a basic success of four. This one is like, you know, you can it just changes it to you know if your parry is really good, and if you the requirements are fighting D10, so you you already there you have seven parry right, and then if you have trademark weapon and other stuff, then you can have really good parry. So I like this one. This one is to me a solid A because uh, it, it's. I I mean I almost think it's stronger. It's stronger than dodge, don't you think? I think it's stronger than dodge for sure. Um, because dodge yeah. is a minus one to hit you with range attacks. This one is you're increasing it from four to at least seven, right? Probably higher than seven. Like a, a, so, that's better than a minus one. And um, it's heroic. So a solid A. So it's heroic. It's heroic. It's a fighting yeah. D10. Yeah. Um, and then the next one's opportunistic. Pretty simple. Just um, when you're dealt a Joker, you get plus four to your trait and damage rolls instead of plus two. Not a big fan of um, yeah, not a big not. fan of, of of edges that require you to get a Joker. So yeah, we do um, not like these. If, if you've seen any of our videos, we don't like these. It's definitely a C edge. Um, uh, again, what can work is if you have what I call the like uh, you know if you have basically a build that is really really taking advantage of initiative. Um, the thing is that's a really edge heavy build and it's edge heavy for combat specifically. So if you have like level-headed, improve level-headed, quick, quick yeah. um, you know, and, and some, maybe some of the abilities that give you that bonus, or, you know, favorite terrain now, right? So if you have one that does it, then stuff like opportunistic can, can really work well, or something like, uh, well, you know, the one that's like doubles your range damage or doubles your melee damage when you get a joker. So there, there is a build here, but it's very, very edge-specific. I mean, uh, if, if you're thinking this is like, I want to be kind of a rogue and taking advantage of situations or whatever, uh, it's just going to come up. It's going to be so niche that you to make it feel good for yourself, you really have to build toward it. So at least get like level headed and quick or two level headed. Yeah, you have to make sure you get as many initiative cards as you possibly can. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Roar. Uh, this is a season spirit D8 requirement. This one is you just roar out and it's a limited action and you can make an intimidation test and a cone template. Um, and all targets resist separately. This one's really good. I mean, uh, there was already social edges where you could, you know, you could take, uh, where you could do it in a burst template, um, uh, in normal suede. This one is a cone. So, you know, take that as you will. I mean, generally burst templates are better. <laughs> uh, well, and this is right? one of those that they talk about, um, might be better tied to an ancestry. Uh, yeah. An ancestry you know. or something you're doing, but... But yeah, generally I think Rabble Rouser, which is this, I believe is the same requirements. Uh, yeah, it's exactly the same. It's Season and Spirit D8. Um, again, they say once per turn. So the sim similar thing, it's a limited action, right? Um, but that one's a burst template. So uh, yeah, I mean, if you want, if you're really into intimidation, I still think, you know, I, I, that's why I'm going to give it a B. Because I still think if it was on its own, it would be an A edge. Because I think Intimidation is one of the best ones you can test for. Because you can get, like, Mean, right? Yeah. Which is a plus two. Um, 
but I just the the rabble rouser is just better. So yeah. All right. Um, then we have uh, savagery, which is um, the the flavor Novice. text is violence is the way of life for some. Um, <laughs> but basically, this edge is you get plus four damage when making a wild attack rather than plus two. Um, it is a novice, so it's something you can you know start off with do a little a little extra a little extra damage. Um, yeah. As a novice character, so that's nice. This one this one was taken right out of the barbarian class edges uh, yeah, from right. Savage Pathfinder. This was like a I believe this was like a seasoned one or like a veteran one. So they popped it down to novice, which is I think is actually fine. It has a very low fighting of a d6. Uh, yeah, if you're doing wild attacks and that's your kind of thing, like if you take berserk especially, which is kind of goes with it, then it's really good. I mean, another, again, here's plus two damage. That's a lot easier to get on than um, uh, than like charge even, right? So yeah, I think it's a B. It's a solid B because generally if you're taking this, you're planning on doing wild attacks. Uh, but, but definitely yeah. you want to have a good build for this. You want to have good toughness because you're probably going to get hit if you're always um, doing wild attacks. So you definitely want to have a good toughness or a shield, right? You, you want to have good defenses before taking this, unless you don't care about getting killed. Who cares? Just um, go in. Violence is a way of life for some. It says it right <laughs> in the text, right in the flavor text. Yeah. Um, Scorch. This one is seasoned Vigor D8 and you need a breath weapon. So this one's very much a ancestry edge basically um again it's they have a couple of these ancestry edges in here so this one's good to just take out it basically pumps up um your breath weapon from 2d6 or whatever it is to the next die up so if you have a 2d6 breath weapon it pumps it up to 2d8 um and you can use cone or stream they've added a new template in this called stream which i like a lot um so yeah i mean if you already have a breath weapon and you like using it then this is a solid b edge it's not a ton of extra damage i mean you know Die increases aren't, you know, numbers of die or flat damage is much more powerful than a straight just one die increase up, right? Um, uh, so, because yeah. on, on but the it's something, is, right? Yeah, and having the stream template is nice. So I, I would say this is just almost like a just just got into the B category for me, the B rank. Okay, uh, then sneak attack is seasoned and it requires uh, assassin. Um, and then uh, plus two bonus from Assassin Edge is replaced by D6. So that's where we just talked about a second ago. Is the plus two better or is the D6? Now the D6 can ace. So this could be like Gonzo. Um, and a D6, I think, you know, statistically the average is a 3.5. Yeah. As far so as damage better. goes. So it is better yeah. um, overall. Um, and it applies to any attack. So the throwing and athletics, fighting, shooting. Um, and this one is again taken right out of Rogue from Savage Pathfinder. Oh, that's now right. this is interesting that's right. because that's right. when we, because in Savage Pathfinder there's no Assassin Edge. They just don't even have that included in there. And when we were going through the um, class edges, Rogue was one we were a little bit hard on because it seemed just at the from the way they did the arcane, uh, sorry, the armor edges for marshals, where which I didn't like and I changed. I mean, you can see my updates to it where basically instead of giving you negatives. If you wear armor, like if, say if you have the rogue cl class edge, then if you wear anything over light armor, you have a, like a minus to all your just agility rolls. Like, and it was weird when you multi-class like fighter to a rogue. So instead I was like, just have it so your class abilities don't work if you're wearing armor over it, you know? Uh, but anyways, so they didn't even have assassin. And we always thought it was weird that like, they had the hindrance of only being able to wear light armor, which was a major hindrance in Pathfinder, which is worth two points. Um, <clears throat> in this, it's a minor hindrance, but whatever. And then they only had sneak attack. And it just didn't really, compared to a lot of the other class edges, I didn't really think it was balanced. I thought it was definitely on the weaker side. But here you can see why, is that they consider sneak attack being worth two edges. Now... <laughs> I don't think it's worth two edges. Do you? I mean, I, I no. all it does here no. is up the plus two to a D6. Um, I, I, it's definitely better. I mean, sneak attack is better than the assassin edge. Like you said, D6 on average is going to get more. You have the ability to ace. So it, it is better than a plus two. Um, but, you know, in my mind, I'm like, I just don't see it being worth taking two edges. So here you might even want to just get rid of assassin and just have sneak attack. Uh, as like a seasoned edge and then maybe add another requirement in it if you don't think it's powerful enough. 
Um, and then there's the improved version, which is now it applies to distracted because assassin is basically if you have a drop or somebody is vulnerable, then you get that plus two, or with sneak attack, you get a d6. With improved sneak attack, it also adds in distracted, which is definitely good. Um, because, you know, there's sometimes things are just, yeah, it, no, you want to increase that. If you're going to do it, yeah, you want to have another a, good, as many another options good, to do uh, it. having a friend who's a good tester can really pay off than when you've got this yeah. edge. So. All right. Um, what was next then? Stunning Blow. Um, season Strength D8. This one's taken right out of Monk. It was one of my favorite features of Monk. Um, this one, they, they've included it with, um, it's, it's either if you use like your fists, any blunt weapon. So fists, but also like hammers and mauls. Um, if you at least cause a shaken or a wounded result, uh, you resolve damage normally and, um, and then they soak and then s separately. So again, uh, you know, if they soak and they get rid of... I mean, they don't really write it out here, Carl, but I'm assuming if they soak and they get rid of Shaken or Wounded, then it doesn't go off. But if they are at least Shaken uh, or Wounded... Uh, again, because I, I don't know, what do you? how do you read this? Because it almost reads to me like if they were going to be Shaken or Wounded, you resolve damage and then they soak, and then this happens regardless of whether they soak or not. That's what it seems like it's written as. Um, so this one's a little bit... To me, it's up in the air. But. I, I, reading this, um, it actually sounds like it it triggers whether you soak it or not. Um, yeah. It says it, it happens after the attempt to soak. Then the victim must make a vigor roll. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so what happens? So after they attempt to soak, uh, they make a vigor roll or they're stunned. So this is I, awesome. I love this one. And because of that new... Th you know, because it works regardless, this is almost S tier for me, honestly. Because uh, really powerful options in games, I think things that work automatically without having you do anything else, right? Things that you're already doing, and then it gives you a really good debuff, which stunned is a really good debuff. I mean, it's really good. <laughs> They've nerfed it a little bit, but it's still really, really good. Uh, this is awesome. And then, now with hammers and mauls, I would almost say this is close getting to S tier for me. I don't think you really need to change it. Uh, I mean, maybe if it's too powerful, you might just allow that if they soak, it doesn't go off, right? Sure, um, sure. But, but I think as it is, it's probably fine. It has a strength D8 is pretty a big, is a big buy-in. Um, so yeah, really, really, I love the flavor of it. I love that it adds in with, you know, anything that had to help with uh, unarmed attacks. Uh, what's your take on this? Would you think it's well, too I think powerful? It's, I think it's cool. I mean, I, I again, I yeah. think it's it's with the you have to make the vigor roll anyway, um, even if you soak it. That's that's a powerful yeah. secondary. It's like two attacks in one, practically. You could get yes, damage, or free. well, you didn't get the damage, you still could get stunned. Um, so that's that's very cool. Very cool. You don't have to spend anything, and just going off of shaken means that like yeah. Really, really good. Uh, then next we have Sunder, which is kind of ho-hum. You've spent your life working with materials, so you get a plus six, uh, plus D6 on your damage total for when you're trying to break an object. And as we know, object damage dice do not do not ace. This one doesn't ace either. So, okay. I, I, I don't know. This, is, this feels like this is a edge you take because you want to have a particular flavor. Not that we, <laughs> which uh, is what <laughs> just you yeah. hate objects. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you're you're a you're a dwarf or something, and you feel like you're going to be breaking stuff. I don't know. Maybe you're breaking doors down because you're a dwarf. I don't know. I, I really don't yeah. know. But it, this is not a yeah not a strong one by any means. And you need a strength of no. D eight too, so to yeah. use it. Yeah. To me, this definitely feels like a. This is very firmly in the C rank. I can see kind of a build here. Um, uh, you know, breaking shields would probably be a big one here because you can break shields. Um, they act as like an object. They have a hardness. Yep. yep. Um, so this that would be the, that would, to me, that's like the biggest mechanical advantage. But I could see like a role-playing thing here of like, you know, breaking, I, I, he's just a big brute and he likes breaking down doors or he likes to break down like somebody's footholds, like they're on a pole or something. So it, it's cool. It's definitely niche, again. So when, I, when I'm saying C, unless I, think some, unless I really think something's complete garbage, you know, C's can still be 
flavorful right. and can be can be effective if you leverage them correctly. So if you took Sunder, you'd really really want a high strength, I think, and then maybe some other type of bonuses like you know savagery or something like that to really get the most damage you could um, off to to kind of you know break through shields or whatever. Um, be good with I think a flail. I, I think there's an item that gives you a bonus to like getting shields or anything. I don't know, but anyways. Um, next one is take the hit. This is a season requires iron jaw and a vigor of d10. Um, this one you get a free reroll on soak rolls made to eliminate wounds or vigor rolls to resist knockdown blows. So yeah, I mean a, a re free rolls on soak. That that's that's a free penny. That's a lot of free pennies. If you're a melee character, then you're probably going to be soaking a lot of stuff, right? And yep. that they added yep. on vigor rolls to resist knockout blows, which knockout blows don't happen that often, so that's kind of just a ribbon ability almost. But yeah, I mean, for a tanky character, I would say this is a pretty much an A. I would think this is an A, a. one. I mean, right? Yeah. Well, it's like you said, free bennies. A um, lot of free bennies. Yeah. 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 For sure. Um, then the next one is a trick shot, which is um, when you perform a test uh, using athletics i'm assuming that means throwing um or shooting skill the archer can the archer then they say specifically the archer when we have an athletics but can choose to make the foe resist with smarts instead of agility okay i mean that that goes good if you're going to use that against the the dumb brutes coming at you and, and you want to take advantage of that yeah um still I, you need athletics a d8 or shooting a d8 so i, I don't know it's not it's not seems to be the greatest of of edges, huh. but that's my opinion. I, uh, so you like it? Yeah, I disagree. I love this one. I mean, uh, when I broke when we did our test video, you know, faint was a big reason why fighting was one of the most flexible ones, um, while shooting was the most reliable one because of a lot of the edges you could take. This basically gives you faint for shooting, and this one I, I think is a good one just to have in course weight. I mean, I forgot forgetting going up to this, but I think a lot of these are good for course weight. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really like this one. I think it, hmm. it if you're, a you know, we, we talked about how shooting and fighting, you can be good at like combat and then you can also have, you can also kind of take a couple edges for for testing, right? So if you take trick shot and you take, a, I forgot the name of the edge in core one where you get rerolls on tests that you initiate. Oh, I mean, there um, you go. Then you have a lot of flexibility in your kit and then being able to switch between smarts and agility, you can really, 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 you know, uh, affect... Like you said, like the fighters, right? They probably don't have good smarts. So I, I like this one a lot. I think, to me, this is an A if you're doing... I, I might give it a B, but I, but really, if you're doing tests, it's not that hard to be a good tester with shooting skill um, because you can get, like, like, trademark weapon. There's a lot of stuff you can do to get advantages with shooting. Um, so, yeah, I, I like this one a lot, actually. <laughs> I just think it's cool. Okay, well, I... You know you convinced me. It's a great edge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, uncanny reflexes. This one is a lot. That's veteran agility D8, athletics D8. Um, this one allows you to ignore the usual minus two agility penalties when making advantage evasion attempts. So unlike improved dodge, just gives you plus two. This is ignoring it. And then you also get regular evasion attempts against area effect attacks uh, that don't usually allow it, but at a minus two. Um, such as burst or blast or even confusion. It's it, this is interesting. Yeah, because those don't uh, powers don't innately give you the ability to evade. Um, so this one does. Now I can't remember if this was there was uncanny reflexes in superpowers, but I remember a lot of games that I was in. We had this as a homebrew rule. I remember I made this, and some other people made this. I can't really remember if this was in the original superpower one, but this one is definitely really really good. I think there's a high bar there, but. You know, uh, area effect attacks. This one I would say is like a B. Um, you don't have to have dodge or improve dodge, but it works still along with improved dodge, right? If you have improved dodge, um, then you're getting that plus two. Uh, let me just make sure that's that's what improved dodge does, right? Um, improved uh, dodge. Recall. Yeah, plus two when you're evading of area effect attacks. So if you're combining this with improved dodge, then you are either you know you're just straight up getting plus two on your evasion rolls, or you're just getting Flat evasion rolls against powers that normally can't be evaded. So you can, and this one, this, this one is really, has, really good for a high agility. Yeah. And this one has, um, you should pull this into all your, all your campaigns, regardless. Oh yeah. Again, all the suede. You're right. Yeah. 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 Um, because, you know, this is just as cool for grenades as it is for, other area effect type weapons. So, all right. Yeah. 
I'm gonna let you uh, grab Wing Gust. Um. Okay. <laughs> uh, wing Gust. <laughs> it's seasoned, and you need wings. Uh, you basically, need wings. if you have wings, if you're a birdman or a birdwoman or a bird, whatever, um, you can gust, which is a limited action, and it requires an athletics roll. And uh, uh, if you critically fail this, then you have you take a level of fatigued. If you're successful, then you get to do a cone template. Um, and the people, uh, enemies in the cone, cone template have to make a vigor roll or they're shaken. If you had a raise on the athletics roll, it's a minus two. So already that's pretty cool. I really like this one. Um, excuse me. It's kind of like breath weapon, but it's, uh, you know, like havoc or uh, whatever. Um, and then if, if you if you if you have a joker when you have this or you're under the or the under the effects of convention, then they're stunned instead. So, again, here here's a little bit of that joker flavor, but that's just like a side note. Also, you can spend conviction to up it. So I really, really like this one. I think if you have wings, this is an A edge. You, I, I mean, just think you should just cool. take it. You should just take you should it just when take you get it. a chance. Yeah. Yeah. It's mechanically really cool. Obviously, you want good athletics because you don't want it to critically fail here. So I would say you probably want at least D8 athletics here uh, just to be kind of safe. That's the minimum. You don't need that as a requirement, but I feel like that's kind of the minimum to take it. But being able to shake in a cone or, you know, stun people in a cone uh, pretty much at will, you know, every round is really powerful. So I think this is an A just for both things. Now, one more thing I want to talk about before we move on is that they have a little section here with the wizard edge, and they say we've taken the wizard edge out because trapping, um, being able to change your trappings is too powerful. Uh, there's a little confusing thing here that we'll talk about the arcane backgrounds is that there, Savage Pathfinder had a universal mod that was a one-point thing where you could change the trapping. Uh, they don't have that here, but in the bookmarks, there is it's listed there. So I'm not sure if it's... They took it out afterwards or if they meant to put it in, but basically Wizard Edge is not allowed. 